Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday, November 16th. Today on The Final Bar, we're talking with Ryan Dietrich from the Carson Group. We'll talk about the S&P pulling back off of resistance around 4,000 yesterday, deteriorating, deteriorating sort of slowly and steadily through the course of the day today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Everyone, welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, data visualization techniques, the technical analysis toolkit to better understand investor psychology, better learn the lessons of market history, and better focus on the evidence the markets provide back to us in the form of price and volume, sort of the basic building blocks of charting and technical analysis. Sort of a steady deterioration through the course of the day today, opening a little bit lower and sort of continuing on that downtrend. The Dow narrowly was uh, dipping in the green there uh, at times, but finished off narrowly uh, negative. The S&P and the NASDAQ uh, down as well, a defensive feel in many ways uh, to the tape. This is as the S&P has been testing resistance around 4,000. Now pulling back a little bit, does this mean the exhaustion point has arrived? In this bear market rally, or is this just a pause before the next big upthrust into the holiday weekend and beyond next week? We'll get to all that and more here in a uh, in a short while. Just to let you know about the upcoming uh, schedule, we have a lot of great guests on the show. I'm excited to talk to um, Ryan Dietrich here in a short while. Uh, one of the best guests in terms of, uh, of of sharing lessons of market history, which I find incredibly valuable. Coming up through the remainder of this week, we have Julius DeKempner of RRG Research joining us uh, tomorrow on Thursday the 17th. On Friday, our latest episode of The Pitch, I'll be moderating a conversation with three uh, key strategists. I just uh, got the charts from John Kosar from Asbury Research. He's one of our three panelists. All of the information on that event can be found at stockcharts.com slash the pitch. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we have the S&P testing 4,000, sort of drifting above there uh, earlier this week, but today sort of uh, continuing to pull back a little bit from that level. Uh, and it's interesting, this bear market rally, as I would continue to label it so far, kind of in the middle between the rally we saw in the first quarter, the rally we saw in the uh, in the third quarter. This one's kind of in the middle, sort of in that 10 to 15 percent range. We'll see if there's further upside to be had, but first we have to get through some key resistance levels. And for today, the S&P pulling back a bit, down 0.8% to 39.60, just a bit below there. The NASDAQ composite, the NASDAQ 100, both down about 1.5%. Mid caps and small caps, both down 1.5%, uh, a little bit more than that as well. It's interesting, you know, in general, there's this inverse relationship between the S&P and the VIX, right? When stocks move higher, it tends to be on lower volatility. When volatility spikes, it tends to be the market moving lower. And that's be, in general because uncertainty and instability, instability are the things that the market doesn't tend to appreciate. So when volatility increases, it usually uh, implies some uncertainty. And that usually is more of a bear market move. A couple of days this week, though, you've had the S&P and the VIX moving in concert with one another, moving together. So yesterday, if I remember right, you had the S&P and the VIX both moving higher. Today, you have the opposite. You have them actually both moving lower uh, through the course of the uh, of the day today. So an interesting relationship to watch. We've talked about the VIX getting down to 20. That's where the previous rallies in 2022 have stalled out. So that's something certainly to uh, pay attention to. Bonds rallying through the course of the day. I mean, the very few things in the green today, uh, fairly defensive stuff like utilities and staple stocks, but also bonds. The TLT was up about 2%. Interest rates, of course, are sort of the inverse of bond prices. And so you had interest rates coming off 10-year yield, finishing the day uh, just below 370, around 369. Now, this is off of you know uh, recent highs uh, you know in recent months, up to around four and a quarter. So we're down quite a bit from that level, over 50 basis points. Um, is there more upside to be had for rates? Potentially. Is there more downside to be had for rates? Potentially. This is the real question I think you want to be thinking about. This is, And I think it's a question that's defined in, in a lot of ways 2022, particularly leadership, right? If you look at the chart 
of the 10-year dollar sign TNX on stock charts and compare that to the relative strength of value stocks versus growth stocks, you can see that those two charts tend to look really, really similar because they're tied to one another, right? Value stocks tend to do better in a rising rate environment. Growth stocks tend to do better in a falling rate environment, generally speaking. Dollar index coming off a bit too. So um, while we've talked about the dollar and described it as the wrecking ball for risk assets, today stocks down and uh, the dollar down as well. Commodities in the red, for the most part, you had natural gas, the UNG was up just a bit, but overall, um, the energy space was lower, precious metals down uh, a bit as well. In crypto land, most of the top 10 coins that we track are all in the red as well. Bitcoin uh, continuing to drift lower, uh, got up to around 17,000 yesterday, but today down around 16,500, getting up to 16,600. Uh, Ether nearing that 1,200 level where it, it bounced off of there earlier today. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. Just check in on the overall patterns. Uh, you know, when we were talking yesterday with Larry Tentarelli, we were debating this chart a little bit before the show and a little bit on the broadcast. Uh, we've had this rally to, I would argue, right around 4,000. Haven't closed above there uh, yet here in this uh, in this move. 4,000 is a compelling level um, because of a couple different things. Number one, it's a big round number. And as hilarious as that might seem to you that the market or a stock would gravitate to a big round number, it's actually been shown to be true. There's been academic research on how orders tend to gravitate around big round numbers. And that's because I would argue psychologically, we tend to revisit a thesis. You tend to question uh, an overall position when something changes that big first digit. That means something to, uh, to uh, humans that trade stocks and ETFs. And as a result, you often see things gravitate to those big round numbers. It's also a Fibonacci level. So 4,000 represents a 61.8% retracement from the August high down to the October low. 61.8% of the way up is right around 4,000. That also represents a 38.2% retracement all the way back to the January highs, the all-time high here. So if you take the January high to the October low, 38.2% of the way up, that's the pink horizontal lines on my chart. So we see a confluence of resistance all around 4,000. That's the lower end of this shaded area. The upper end of the shaded area is capturing the 200-day moving average, which is currently around 4070, just a little bit above there. So would I expect resistance in this range? 100% yes, which is why a brief, uh, you know, choppiness and a bit of a pullback uh, here today, I think makes a good makes good technical sense. But also tells me if we can get through these levels of resistance that I've identified, talk about a new uh, paradigm, right? Something new, a, a change of character in the chart where we're not just rallying to resistance, but we're rallying through resistance. That might be something to pay attention to. Also note the RSI, which barely got above 60, but really didn't stay there. It's kind of back below that 60 level. That often is a good indication overall of bull and bear market phases. Looking at sectors here, just to finish off our uh, market recap today, we have the utility sector, the staple sector, and healthcare one, two, and three. So very much a defensive feel at the top of the list. Utilities, the best performer up 0.9%. On the bottom, Energy down 2%. This is obviously one of the leading sectors and, and not even close. I mean, by far the best performing sector year to date in 2022. Many of those energy stocks not far off from 52-week uh, uh, highs and, and, and in many cases, all-time highs. After that, you have the three leading sectors from yesterday now giving back a lot of those gains. Consumer discretionary, technology, communication services, down all down 1% to 1.5%. Now, is it all bad? No, right? You have TJ Maxx and other earnings names having a pretty decent day. TJX was up over 5% today, making a new 52-week high. So it's a great reminder that even when, you know, it depends on how you define the market. If the market, quote unquote, means the major indexes, they're down today, right? The S&P down 1%, the NASDAQ down 1.5% or so. But if you look at individual stocks, there are stocks making new 52-week highs. There are stocks making new three-month highs, which is the scan that I run every week for my Market Misbehavior Premium members. We found a number of stocks like TJX starting to break out. So if there is a time to keep your scans running and be looking for stocks that are not just performing well on an absolute basis, but performing well on a relative basis, that time is now. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Ryan Dietrich. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. It's a pleasure to have you join us for our show. A couple of quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Ryan Dietrich. First off, we welcome your questions. We had a great mailbag segment yesterday. We'll do another one at the end of this week on Friday's show. We'd love to feature one of your questions on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we're on YouTube. 
put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. Larry Williams just posted his latest market update. Very much worth a watch. He, he brilliantly called this rally that we've seen in stocks. What is he looking at between now and year end? I would check out that video along with our recent episodes of The Pitch, all of our special events, and our fantastic shows that uh, are broadcast every trading day. All of that is at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Ryan Dietrich. Ryan's the chief market strategist at Carson Group, coming to us from his home office in Omaha, Nebraska. Ryan, great to see you. Great to have you on the show. How are you? Dave, I'm doing well. Yeah, last time I was on with you, I was at a different shop, but I am so excited. I finished. I think my 100th day was like two weeks ago or so at Carson Group, or one of the largest RAs in the country, one of the fastest growing RAs in the country, and I am absolutely having a blast. It's a great spot, and they're very lucky to have you, Ryan. And congrats also on the move back to Ohio. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's yeah. get to your charts. First chart is talking about really the presidential cycle. We've come through the midterm election season. What does this tell you about uh, looking forward? Yeah, Dave, you know, you've got so many great technicians that come on. So I'm taking a little bit of a different look, I guess, more seasonality. And what we knew about this year, and I think I probably shared this chart with you, you know, three, four months ago, maybe six months ago when I came on with you. That, listen, early in a midterm year, stocks usually don't do that well, right? We knew that. And you can see on the chart, again, the second quarter is like the worst quarter out of the four-year presidential cycle. I believe the S&P lost about 16% in the second quarter of this year. So, you know, that played out. But I think what investors need to be aware of is that those are the headwinds. Those are the issues that were there. And believe me, you could talk to 10 people, get 10 answers. I think it's as simple as with a new president, that second year, you start to hit some bumps, kind of what we've seen this year, obviously, and stocks don't do as well. But the truth is the tailwind is now here. These next couple quarters are like the best quarters out of 16 quarters of a four-year presidential cycle. One more stat on this, and we've all seen it and it's been out there. But if you look at the day after the midterm elections and go out one year, Dave, the S&P has been higher every single time since World War II, up 14.1% on average. Not all those years were up a ton, I'm aware, but still, they all were higher. So I think it's just important for investors to remember that the, the seasonals really are a tailwind now versus a headwind most of this year. That's a great, uh, great change in how that has uh, has played out. Something to think about going forward. Your second chart here is looking at some particular years related to the elections. Talk us through this one, if you could. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think this is kind of timely, right? The whole is gridlock good. I mean, the answer apparently is yes, because what I'm sharing here are all the times since 1950 we've had a split Congress. I'm not so throw out who the president is. Believe me, it matters who the president is, but I'm just talking about the makeup of Congress if it's split. And you can see there, I mean, let me zone in. Yeah, 13.7% is the average return. We have gridlock. And you can see we've had some really good gains over there. Now it's never that simple. I'm fully aware. But I think this is another thing that says, you know what? We know, well, it's not official, official, but we, we're pretty sure Republicans are going to have like a three or four seat a majority in the House. It's like the smallest majority that they've ever had. And then you've got, you know, likely a very small majority for the Democrats. You talk about in a Senate, you talk about gridlock. I mean, that's gridlock, right? And this mm. is just another way of showing maybe that's good. Checks and balances, not too much power one way or the other. There's other factors, yes. But this is not something to be uh, worried about, I think, in our opinion. Gridlock can be good according to this uh, data. So this is sort of a bullish feel to our conversation here this far. And I'd love to just show my chart of the S&P 500, get yeah. your take on what I described. And the market recap we talked about, obviously, this is an impre incredible run off of the October lows, a really nice bounce, 10 plus percent. We've now hit this 4,000 level. When you look between now and year end, it sounds like you're constructive. Where do you see things headed from here? Yeah, I mean, we would be constructive. Like you said, we had this big 10% bounce or almost 15% off the intraday lows back in the middle of October or so. I mean, just think of this, right? November historically is a pretty strong month. It's the best month of the year since 1950, best month the last 10 years, second best month in a midterm year. Oh, and then you got, you know, this potentially the Santa Claus rally. So things aren't ever that simple. But, you know, we think that uh, this upward trajectory that we've had so far, maybe a little break or so uh, in the middle of November here, but it still makes sense to us that we can keep going and potentially get back above that 200 day, which isn't that far away this is one of the longest streaks we've ever seen beneath the 200 day and that could be just some more baby steps in the right direction to um potentially you know maybe some better times ahead into, into next year ryan when you're looking we only have about a minute left here but yep. when you're looking at sectors and themes and how they're playing out 
We've had something like the energy sector, by far the outlier, strongest the performer this year. But recently, yeah. we've had a bit of a shift. You've had things like semiconductors, which have been underperforming, starting to really, really emerge. When you're looking for opportunities between now going into uh, the beginning of next year, where are you seeing opportunities for equity investors? Yeah, we really like the small cap names. I mean, there's some relative strength coming in there. There's a lot more small caps participating than there are large caps. And honestly, you know, those industrials, which are finally starting to emerge with some nice relative strength breakouts, those are two areas we like, uh, you know, into next year, even further out, but at least for the rest of this year. Ryan, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on. Congrats on the move to the Carson Group. Very much congrats moving back to Ohio. Say hi to it for uh, for me, for sure. And we'll talk to you again soon. OH, Dave. Thank you. Bye, Ryan. Take care. Bye-bye. That's Ryan Dietrich. Ryan's the uh, chief market strategist at the Carson Group. Again, uh, just uh, uh, coming to us from Omaha. Really good take on, on things overall. And as always, I, when I think of Ryan and his work, uh, incredible job highlighting some of the lessons of market history. When I think about my experience at the Fidelity chart room, talking with a lot of institutional investors, a lot of financial advisors, I feel that charts provide the best history lesson you will ever need to understand where we're at relative to where we've been. Very much appreciate Ryan's uh, take on some of those key charts, uh, thinking about market history. Let's continue on our show today with our next segment, Banking on Breadth. What we like to do is check in on some of the breadth indicators, often an interesting way to look underneath the hood on the major averages. As we've talked about, the S&P and NASDAQ having a nice rally off of the October lows, now rallying into some key resistance levels. The question is, what's next? Let's look at some of these breadth indicators and see what they can tell us about the conditions underlying the movement in the uh, in the indexes. We'll start with the S&P 500 and uh, my chart that looks at cumulative advanced decline lines. Now, this is uh, from the top. We have the uh, New York Stock Exchange common stock only line to start. We have large caps, mid caps, and small caps. So literally every day, how many stocks go up, how many stocks go down, that's your daily advancers, decliners uh, number. You take those as an aggregate over time. So every day you add or subtract from that running total, and that turns it into these data series which are the cumulative advanced decline lines. The most important one, in my opinion, is this top one, which is the New York Stock Exchange. It's the broadest universe, has a lot of names, and it kind of takes the overweight of the mega caps, which is very much a part of the uh, S&P and the NASDAQ. It takes that uh, overweight off because these are equal weighted measures of, uh, of, of breadth. And so it's a great way to compare what's happening with the indexes, what's happening with these breadth measures. So what do things look like coming off of the October lows? In the short term, absolutely constructive. I think that's undeniably so. All four of these have gotten back above their 50-day moving average. They all broke down back here in August and September, made a new low. All four of them made a new low, as the S&P did in October. That was when we were pre feeling pretty confident about a deep bear retrenchment, just going right down to 3,200 with no break. Boy, things stopped very quickly, and now we've had this nice bounce off of the lows from 3,600, just below there on a closing basis, to just below 4,000. So at this point, I would I would consider these neutral from a medium-term, long-term perspective. That's why I've very subjectively color-coded these uh, neutral orange. I will color code them uh, bullish green if we can make it above the August highs. I think that's when the S&P chart looks undeniably positive, and I think that's where the breadth indicators would also look very constructive, making new uh, making new highs. Now, what's interesting is in August, we made a new high. That was the end of that move. In October, we made a new low really in September, and that was near the end of that move. So maybe that's not the best pattern to look back going forward. But over time, that is certainly how I've used the advanced decline lines, and I will stick to the lessons of market history and pay attention to what happens there. In an interview earlier this week uh, with a couple different uh, media outlets, I was sharing this chart looking at the percent of stocks above their 50 and 200 day moving averages. In blue, we have the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 200 day. That stands around 53%. As of today's close, 81% of the S&P members are above their 50 day moving average. That means a full four out of uh, four out of five or 80% of the S&P 500 stocks, over 400 of the 500 are above their 50-day moving average. That is a broad advance with most things showing short-term strength. Here's the thing, that's short-term strength. The long-term strength is what's reflected in this other series, which is the percent above their 200-day, and it's just above 50%. Now, I have this pink horizontal line because I have, in general, learned that the indicator being above 50% is generally bullish, below 50% is generally bearish. That was a great indication here in the first half of 2020, when we obviously went down to single digits of stocks above their 200-day moving average when everything was going down. 
And all of a sudden you saw that start to improve. It really didn't get above 50% for good until July, which was a little uh, further on in this move. But it really told you that the strength was positive, that the trend was positive. And coming out of the, the, uh, the, the consolidation phase in September and October of 2020, that breakout with uh, most stocks above their 200 day really shared, uh, showed the strength in, uh, in stocks, that broad advance. Now, we're once again potentially doing that, and that's why I think this is an important chart to watch. Can we hold above 50%? If we pull back and this line starts going back below 50%, that's where I would have to question that sort of bullish thesis. So, you know, the the, the trend that has pushed us to this point may not be enough to uh, continue us a little bit further. I want to uh, next look at a couple different charts using the bullish percent indexes. This is a set of, uh, of indicators, breadth indicators driven off of point and figure charts. And just to digress a moment, if we look at a point and figure chart of Apple, for example, um, a chart of uh, any point and figure chart has, uh, you can you can basically uh, come down to a bullish or bearish trend. And there are a couple different ways you could do this. You could look at what column it's in. Is it in a column of X's or O's? You could look at a bunch of different uh, levels. But what we look at and what the bullish percent indexes do, is they look at the most recent signal. So what is the most recent signal on this chart? Um, a buy signal, is when a column of X's goes above the pre previous column of X's. A sell signal is a column of O's that goes lower than the previous column of O's. So the most recent signal on the chart of Apple, even though it's rallied off of the lows, is a sell signal because the most recent signal was a break uh, to no, to no lows. It's called a double bottom uh, breakout. As a result, that is one that is not uh, included in the bullish percent. That's actually showing you a, a negative uh, sign. And when we look at the S&P 500, this does that same exercise with all 500 stocks. What percent of them have the most recent signal been a buy signal? We're at 73% as of today's close, which means three out of every four S&P names have most recently had a buy signal. Here's the thing. Look back on this chart, and I've highlighted in purple or in pink here, every time that this indicator has gone above 70%, which is considered sort of a bull confirmed pattern. Look at what happens when the indicator goes above 70% and then comes out of the 70% range, which is at the end of these purple shaded areas. That really lined up beautifully with the top in January, with the top in early April, with the top in mid-August. And that is something I'll be looking for right about now. As we think about this rally that, again, has been an impressive rally, out of, a rally off the lows, what would suggest to me that this uptrend is exhausted and confirm that we're starting to see some bearish rotation? This indicator getting below 70% would certainly be one of those items. Now, the next chart we can look at is the NASDAQ's version of that. This is the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index. So it's looking at 100 stocks, what percent of them most recently have had a buy signal. And I'm highlighting here when it comes out of that 70% range. That happened here in uh, mid-February, happened in early April, happened in early June and happened in mid-August. Those are really the four arguably most significant tops after uh, the new year began. And this is why this indicator is important to watch as well. We have now gone above 70%, and I'm watching to see if and when we come below. It did not quite get there today, but this is why these charts can be helpful. Indicators like this are great ways of measuring, or I guess identifying when a certain trend is in play, but then anticipating when that trend may be reversed. And that's something I'll be looking for uh, right there. Next breadth indicator uh, we have is the McClellan Oscillator. I wanted, wanted to highlight, and, and someone mentioned this on, on social media, and forgive me for not jotting down. I see so many charts and, and comments. I apologize if this was you. Um, thank you for sharing this and pointing it out to me. I, I apologize. I don't have your name ready to share because I do like to credit things when, uh, when, when I can. Uh, but one of the things that was highlighted was basically uh, some of these divergences that you had. I have a number of times where the market goes a little bit higher. But you see the McClellan Oscillator making lower highs. That happened there in uh, late March. Uh, certainly happened. Uh, he, that's not it. Where was it? I was going to say. Uh, let's see one of these. Here we go. Price is going higher and the uh, McClellan Oscillator going lower. Once again, we have higher highs late October into mid-November. And we have lower peaks here. It's kind of another interesting take on breadth indicators looking for divergences where the price does one thing, the indicator does another. The McClellan Oscillator is really derived from... Um, uh, advanced decline data. It's, it's it's literally looking at a smoothed out version of the uh, of of the uh, advanced decline data. If you know the MACD indicator, which Jerry Appel created, uh, this was uh, the McClellan uh, the McClellan family. Sherman McClellan and his wife uh, created this indicator years ago. Tom McClellan has continued to tell the story and promote uh, the McClellan oscillator and the McClellan summation index very uh, aptly. So. 
Um, one of the things that uh, this uh, what 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 this basically does is it's sort of taking a MACD using exponential averages to smooth out the advanced decline data. And just like you would look for divergences with the MACD indicator, you can look at divergences with the McClellan oscillator. I can't help but notice this bearish this bearish divergence with the McClellan oscillator occurred going into the April peak. It occurred going into the August peak, and once again, we're seeing it now. So again, while I'm impressed with the rally off of the lows, and again, I have to admit, it's stronger than I would have expected as the S&P was making a new low uh, in September and October, and the breadth lines were all breaking down. I would argue some of these breadth indicators and some of the resistance levels we've talked about suggest to me that we are at or near an exhaustion point in this rally. I'm looking to see the next leg lower. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three in three. Let's hit on three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. And here's chart number one. In our final segment here on banking on breadth, we talked about uh, per bullish percent indexes. This is a traditional technique looking at point and figure charts and turning them into breadth indicators. We're looking at the last two years, but I just wanted to highlight what 2002 has been like. You can see when the indicator has gone above 70%, those are highlighted in purple. You can see when it's gone below 30%, those are highlighted in red. Note how when it comes out of that 70% region, sort of out of this overbought region, that has been uh, usually market tops. You can see when it's gone below 30% and come out, those have lined up pretty well with market bottoms. You had a great indication of a market bottom there in mid-October. We are now showing the confirmed signals of a rally. Breaking below 70% for me would 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 uh, indicate a likely return to some of these previous tops and uh, and a likely retrenchment or a pullback in the S&P. It has not happened yet for the S&P or the NASDAQ, but it's certainly something I want to, uh, want to look at. Chart number two, really appreciate having Ryan Dietrich on the show. As always, he brought some great uh, market history, some cycles uh, to think about. And again, I when I talk with Ryan, I'm reminded about how powerful the seasonal tendencies can be. And he is absolutely right. In a midterm election year, this fourth quarter, particularly after the elections between there and year end, on average have been incredibly strong. And that's something certainly to uh, to note. If we would go weaker here through, re uh, through year end and into the beginning of next year, that would be highly unusual. What would be much more common would be a rally between now and year end and then, uh, you know, be, maybe, maybe begin another leg down in the new year if we are going to eventually uh, get lower, which I think we are. Having said that, I asked Ryan for uh, interesting ideas. I didn't know he was going to say industrials, and I'm glad that I picked that as one of the uh, three and three charts. I like the rally in industrials. What's interesting is the XLI has hit $100 a share, big round number. That's always something to pay attention to. While the S&P is not up to its August high just yet, um, it's around 4,300. Um, the uh, XLI, the industrial sector is, it's actually testing its August high in the last week. So far, it has failed to propel through that uh, indicator or through that uh, price level. It was overbought back in August. It was overbought again earlier this week. If the XLI can get above 100, if it can get above the August peak, that could be very bullish for industrials. And I'm seeing a lot of charts that have run very well, but that would suggest to me that there might be further upside. We also talked a little bit about semiconductors and a uh, big gap lower here on LRCX, which is LAM Research. It's a large cap uh, semiconductor name. What's interesting about uh, LRCX is you had a peak here in late May, early June, another one in early August. That's right around 520, uh, we'll call it 530, 535, right? We've now broken above the 200-day moving average, and I'm eyeing that level of overhead resistance. We didn't quite make it there, and now we've gapped back below the 200-day. Tw uh, this is as the RSI comes out of that overbought region. Stocks like LRCX being unable to break to new highs, I think would be damning evidence for the potential of a bullish market continuation. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. Special thanks to Ryan Dietrich joining us from the Carson Group, sharing some great lessons of market history. For StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.